Chapter 10 The Voyage Auntie's Bloomers can hear me perfectly. Thanks, Auntie's Bloomers. Thank you for letting us know. So if we recall, we're, we're on the ship now. It's, we're about to kick off. All that night, we were in a great bustle getting things stowed in their place, and boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Blandley and the like. Mr. Blandley is sort of the big, the big toff who sold him the ship in the first place. Backhand deal. They, they look after each other. They look after each other, those sorts of people. So there's more than one. There's Blandly and the others. Blandly and Biffy and Boffy and Squaffy and Squidly. Why, we were all at... We were all at Pompington's Academy together. Coming, uh, coming off to wish him a good voyage and safe return. Good voyage, Trelawney. Thank you, Blandly. Have a good trip. Trelawney! Thanks, Bobby! What ho, Trelawney! Good! All the, meanwhile, all the sailors just like bustling past them with loads of crates on their arms like that. Excuse me. Excuse me. Say, ah, wonderful! What a wonderful looking. Excuse me. Sorry. You know, four crates of dried fish here. Come on. Getting in the way. Just getting in the way. We never had a night at the Admiral Bembo when I had half the work. Well, that's saying something because, as we've established, he does most of all the work himself. And I was dog tired when, a little before dawn, the bosun sounded his pipe, <whistles> and the crew began to man the capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the deck. All was so new and interesting to me. The brief commands, the shrill note of the whistle. The men bustle into their places in the glimmer of the ship's lanterns. No, Barbara! Oh, uh, this is another sort of um, sailor extra. Now, barbecue! Tip us a stave! cried one voice. The old one! cried another. So there's a couple of. Barbecue. Barbecue here is referring to Long John because he's the cook, he's barbecue. Barbecue, tip us a stave, sing us a song, cried one voice. The old one, said another. Aye, aye, mates, said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm, and at once broke out in the air and words I knew so well. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest, and then the whole crew bore chorus. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. <gasps> and at that third ho, drove the bars uh, drove the bars before them with a will. Yo ho ho and a bottle of getting the wheel going. Now, even at that exciting moment, it carried me back to the old Admiral Bembo in a second, and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping the chorus. Flashback, flashback, flashback. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum, 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 rum. Oh, oh God. Something wrong, Jim. No. Flashback, flashback. But soon, the anchor was short up. Soon it was hanging dripping at the bow, at the bows. The bows? At the bows, soon the sails began to draw. So it's all kicking off. Clink, 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 clink. All coming up. All the sails coming up and on the rigging. All the men climbing, getting ready to go. Soon the sails began to draw and the land and shipping to flip by on either side. They're getting out of the harbour, getting out by Bristol Harbour. And before I could lie down to snatch an hour of slumber, the Hispaniola had begun her voyage. To the Isle of Treasure. A.K.A. Treasure Island. I'm not going to relate the voyage in detail. No. It was fairly prosperous. Good to hear. The ship proved to be a good ship. The crew were capable seamen. And the captain... All right, Captain Smalley, remember him. Thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island... 
Two or three things had happened which require to be known. Mr. Arrow, the first mate, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. He had no command among the men, and people did what they pleased with him. But that was by no means the worst of it. For after a day or two at sea, he began to appear on deck with hazy eye, red cheeks, stuttering tongue, and other marks of drunkenness. We've all been there, Mr. Arrow, we've all been there. Time after time he was ordered below in disgrace. Sometimes he fell and cut himself. Oh, he's rubbish. Bear in mind, they're on, they're on a moving ship. This is a man who needs to have, you know, have his footing. Sometimes just, he's just fought me while he's sort of slipped there like, get the man, Mr. Arrow, get the man in the rigging. Mr. Arrow's slipping over and landing on a sword. Sometimes he lay all day long in his little bunk at one side of the companion. Sometimes for a day or two he would be almost sober and attend to his work at least passably. Well, it's not good enough really, is it? In the meantime, we could never make out where he got the drink. That was the ship's mystery. Watch him as we pleased, we could do nothing to solve it. And when we asked him to his face, he would only laugh if he were drunk, and if he were sober, deny solemnly that he ever tasted anything but water. Sounds like a drinker. Sounds like a drinker. Always defensive. Defensive. That's a, a sign, I, I always think. Me? No, 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 no. Didn't, didn't, drink, didn't drink that much, really. Are you sure? Because the 16 cans of lager on the street outside, you're... No. Barely had anything, barely had anything. That's Mr. Arrow. He was not only useless as an officer and a bad influence amongst the men, not a good word to say about Mr. Arrow at this point, but it was plain at this rate he must soon kill himself outright. So nobody was much surprised nor very sorry, that's a bit harsh, when one dark night with a head sea he disappeared entirely and was seen no more. So he's that pissed up. He's gone our other side. Overboard, said the captain. Well, gentlemen, that saves the trouble of putting him in irons. <sighs> captain Smollett does not piss about. He does not mince his words. Dead, is he? Oh, it saves arresting him. But there we were, without a mate. And it was necessary, of course, to advance one of the men. The bosun, Job Anderson, good old Job, was the likeliest man aboard. And though he kept his old title, he served in a way as mate. Mr Trelawney had followed the sea, and his knowledge made him very useful, for he often took a watch, he often took a watch himself in easy weather. Oh, that's good. So actually, Squire Trelawney's chipping in for once. And again, that's quite sort of aristocratic. Don't worry, I'll do it. Like you hear about those mad officers in the war. You'd be like, Sir, we've lost the rear gunner. Don't worry, boys, I'll man the guns. And I was like, Oh my god. That's Squire Trelawney in this scenario. What's happened to Mr. Arrow? He's fought, he's, he was that pissed up, he's fallen over the side of the ship. Not to worry, I'll do his job. Are you sure? Yes. And the coxswain, Israel Hands, was a careful, wily, old, experienced seaman who could be trusted at a pinch with almost anything. He was a great confidant of Long John Silver, and so the mention of his name leads me to speak, leads me on to speak of our ship's cook, Barbecue, as the men called him. Aboard ship, he carried his crutch by a lanyard round his neck. Like a, like a key worker. To have both hands as free as possible. It was something to see him wedge the foot of the crutch against a bulkhead and, propped against it, yielding to every movement of the ship, get on with his cooking like someone say for sure. That is impressive, isn't it? That's a man who's been to sea more than once with one leg. Still more strange it was 
to see him in the heaviest of weather cross the deck. He had a line or two rigged up to help him across the wildest spa- the widest spaces. Long John's earrings, they were called. And he would hand himself from one place to another, now using the crutch, now trailing it alongside by the lanyard as quickly as another man could walk. Yet some of the men who had sailed with him before expressed their pity to see him so reduced. He's no common man, barbecue, said the coxswain, Israel Adams, to me. He had good schooling in his young days and can speak like a book when so minded and brave. A lion's nothing alongside Long John. I've seen him grapple four and knock their heads together, him unarmed. He's from London, Israel Adams. I'm running out of accent. All the crew respected and even obeyed him. He had a way of talking to each and doing everybody some particular service. To me, he was unweariedly kind and always glad to see me in the galley, which he kept as clean as a new pin, the dishes hanging up burnished and his parrot in a cage in one corner. Oh, that sounds like a lovely kitchen. Lovely kitchen. Come away, Hawkins, he'd say. Come and have a yarn with John. Nobody more welcome than yourself, my son. Sit down and hear the news. Here's Captain Flint. I calls me part of Captain Flint after the famous buccaneer. Here's Captain Flint predicting success to our voyage, wasn't you, Captain? And the parrot would say, with great rapidity, Pieces of eight. Pieces of eight. And, you guessed it, Pieces of eight. Till you wondered that it was not out of breath. Or till Long John threw his handkerchief over the cage. Ha ha ha! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Ha ha! Peep! Help. Now that bird, he would say, is maybe 200 years old, Hawkins. They lives forever mostly, and if anybody's seen more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate. She's been at Madagascar and at Malabar and Suriname and Providence and Portobello. She was at the fishing up of the wrecked plate ships. It's there she learned pieces of eight. And little wonder, 350,000 of them, Hawkins. She was at the board of the Viceroy of the Indies, out of Goa she was. And to look at her, you would think she was a babby. But you smelled powder, didn't you, Captain? Stand by to go about. The parrot would scream. Ah, uh, she's handsome craft she is. The cook would say, and give a sugar from his pocket. And then the bird would peck at the bars and swear straight on, passing belief for wickedness. There, John would add, you can't touch pitch and not be more glad. Here's this poor old innocent bird of mine swearing blue fire and none the wiser. You may lay to that. She'd swear the same in a manner of speaking before chaplain. And John would touch his forelock with a solemn way he had that made me think he was the best of men. Ha ha ha. <laughs> as Jim lost his memory says uh, Lockdown Ginger Belly B warned him about Captain Flint he did he did warn him about Captain Flint but that's just the name of the, of the parrot here it's just the name of the parrot we don't know if Long John's been hanging out with Captain but according to this Captain Flint the parrot is 200 years old in 1769 so this is a parrot that was born in 1569 any biologists uh, on the stream confirm whether a parrot can live for 200 years? Oh, I don't think a parrot can live for 200 years. Although my nan did have a minor bird that lived for... It's got to be 20 years that that bird was knocking about. It's got to be 20 years. I mean, we had that when I was really little. It died about 2014, that bird. I mean, it kept dying and going belly up. And you'd be like, oh, the bird's dead. And then the next day it'd just be up and about again. Possessed. Possessed, that bird. Anyway. So this bird, this 200-year-old this parrot, just sat in Long John's kitchen just swearing all the time. You can't touch a pitch and not be mugged. Very true. In the meantime, 
The squire and Captain Smollett were still on pretty distant terms with one another. They don't sound like they gel, really, do they? The squire and the captain. The captain strikes me as a bit of a self-made man. Self-made man. A bit of a John Smith uh, character. I'm guessing some old, some old market town grammar school he's gone to. He's made his way to the to the sea, and he's he's come up and he's come up an officer. He's come up a naval. And, well, he's a he's a sort of he's freelance. Is he a freelance ship's captain, Captain Smollett? Worked his way up. Squire Trelawney's is like, oh, I'll pay for it, I'll pay for it. He's like, yeah, you bloody pay for it if you want. Fucking oh, waste of space. Not done a bloody day's work in his... I've been to... I've been all over the world. You're on your fucking gap year, son. I've put the fucking hours in me. Things I've seen make your hair curl, son. If it weren't under that stupid wig. But then he's got to wear a wig as well, so he feels a bit silly having to go at his wig. Because they've all got to wear wigs in these days. I wish we all... I wish it was still compulsory for us all to wear wigs. Actually, I don't. I don't know why I said that. Be, it would be funny, though, wouldn't it? It would be funny if it was just it, it was just accepted fashion, like in the same way we wear jeans, that we just had to wear wigs. Those days. Those hideous, hideous days. Um, oh, we go, no, we go. Pick up the pace, George. Pick up the pace tonight. It's all them tech, all them tech mishaps. Put me off my stride. I'm talking about wigs. I'm talking about minor birds. Crazy stuff, crazy stuff. So the squire and the captain, they're still a bit at loggerheads. The squire made no bones about the matter. He despised the captain. The captain, on his part, never spoke but when he was spoken to, and then sharp and short and dry, and not a word wasted. He owned, when driven into a corner, that he seemed to have been wrong about the crew, because he didn't like the crew member. He said, I don't like the look of these pe- these bloody sailors. They look a bit rough to me. I don't like them. I don't, want- I don't even want to go. Fire me, was basically the conversation there, wasn't it? That some of them were as brisk as he wanted to see, and all had behaved fairly well. As for the ship, he'd taken a downright fancy to her. She'll lie a point nearer the wind than a man has a right to expect of his own married wife, sir. But, he would add, all I say is we're not home again, and I don't like this cruise. He doesn't like this cruise. The squire at this would turn away and march up and down the deck, chin in air. A trifle more of that man, he would say, and I shall explode. We had some heavy weather, which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and they must have been hard to please if they had been otherwise, for it's my belief there was never a ship's company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going on the least excuse. There was duff on odd days. Sweet pudding. You know, like plum duff. As, for instance, if the squire heard it was any man's birthday. <laughs> That's quite sweet. It, it's old. It's old. One, one-handed, six-toothed Bill's birthday. Do us a plum duff, Long John. Happy birthday to you. That's nice. And always a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for anyone to help himself that had the fancy. Never no good come of it yet, the captain said to Dr. Livesey. Spoil foxalans, mate devils, that's my belief. But good did come of the apple barrel, as you shall hear. For if it had not been for that, we should have had no note of warning and might all have perished by the hand of treachery. This was how it came about. We had run up the trades to get the wind of the island we were after. So he's, he's talking about the, tr- the trade winds that they would have had to follow. There's, all, there's more sort of nautical stuff. Don't worry about it. It's basically you've got to navigate your ship by whatever winds there are. So certain ships expect to be blah, 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 blah. blah. So they've gone up their winds and to get, to get to the right wind to the island. And as he says, I'm not allowed to be more plain because he can't reveal which wind it is that he wants to be following because that's going to give away the secret location of the island. And now... We were running down for it with a bright lookout day and night. 
It was about the last day of our outward voyage, by the largest computation. Sometime that night, or at latest, before noon of the morrow, we should sight the Treasure Island. We were heading SSW, south-southwest, and had a steady breeze abeam and a quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily, dipping her bowsprit now and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing alow and aloft. Everyone was in the bravest spirits because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over and I was on my way to my berth, my little bedroom, you know, with the little hammock like we talked about on Friday, it occurred to me that I should like an apple. Knock yourself out, Jim. Knock yourself out. Get one of them in you, get an apple down. You're there for everyone to enjoy. They're there for everyone to enjoy. I ran on deck. The watch was all forward looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail and whistling away gently to himself. That's the best approximation I can do of of an, an easygoing sailor. Um, and that was the only sound excepting the swish of the sea against the bows and around the sides of the ship in I got bodily into the apple barrel now that sounds a bit mad but these barrels would have been big I've actually been in one of those barrels from those days believe it or not I was in a play once where I played someone hiding in a, a barrel and they're massive huge grabby things are very and I was 20 at the time so very easy for this six-year-old to clamber into this barrel not so easy to get back out I guess but you know cross that bridge when you come to it he's young he's having a good time he wants an apple in I got bodily into the apple barrel and found there was scarce an apple left but sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship, I'd either fallen asleep or I was on the point of doing so, when a heavy man sat down with rather a clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and before I heard a dozen words... I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there, trembling and listening, in the extreme of fear and curiosity. For from those dozen words, I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended upon me alone. End of chapter.